Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another session of Sustainable Saturday. Sustainable Saturdays are a series of sessions based on various environmental, ecological, and biodiversity related topics delivered to you by people from various walks of life. I am Sandra Pereira, your speaker for today, and I have completed my master's in wildlife management and have been working in the field of education for biodiversity and sustainability for the past nearly three years. My aim is basically to educate lay people about complex biodiversity and environment related topics in a manner that it helps them to develop interest and want to learn more about this field. And Today, I will be talking to you about this topic that I find rather interesting, habitat indicator species. So let's look at what is going to be covered in today's session. So first, I will give you a little basics about uh, ecology, the definition of indicator species, the different types or uh, broad categories of indicator species, some terminologies around this concept. The determination of indicator species, a very classic example of the lichen as indicator species, and a conclusion to this topic. Okay. So, uh, when you talk about an ecosystem, and this is something that uh, I teach to my uh, green school kids under the green schools campaign that we run here at Green Yatra. So, uh, when you see an ecosystem, an ecosystem is basically an area where there are different abiotic, biotic, living and non-living, uh, you know, uh, plants, animals, and all other factors that live together. Okay. Now, every species in an ecosystem is important, even the tiniest ones. All right. So, if you look and if you, you know, uh, look at all of these bigger documentaries and all of that, uh, you will normally see that there are massive animals like you know tigers all your bigger mammals your elephants and all of these guys are shown to unimportance to us but an ecosystem is actually built in a manner where every species is actually interlinked with each other okay and a single species taken out can actually have a cascading effect on the ecosystem one simple way of uh, explaining this is through the ecological web so uh, ecological web is basically it's this activity that I had learned during my bachelor's and now I go teach it to the kids that I uh, interact with. So it basically shows you how each organism in a particular ecosystem is interdependent on each other. Okay. So if you look at this picture. So there is grass and then, you know, there are some animals that are dependent on the grass. Like you can see grasshoppers, mice. There are bigger trees. There are uh, animals that are dependent on those like giraffes for acacia. Yeah? And then they in turn have other animals dependent on them. So, you know, a snake would eat the rat. And then the snake would rather uh, later get picked up, you know, by an um, eagle. Okay? They are all interlinked with each other. You can, if, if you try and design your own thing, you have like a small plant, then you will have a monkey on it. Monkeys depend on bananas. Bananas are eaten by humans um humans will decompose and go into the soil and then there is soil microfauna which helps the plants grow. each element of an ecosystem is interdependent on each other okay, okay this is established so any single uh any single aspect of this ecosystem taken out can actually have an impact on the ecosystem in a manner that the ecosystem can completely collapse like sabhi kuch Chala jayega if even one single aspect of one single organism from that ecosystem is taken down. All right. But there are certain species which have an added significance in an ecosystem in a manner that they can tell you about the overall health of the ecosystem. So these particular species, if you look at them and try to study them or see their behaviors, uh, it will in a manner help you understand the vast ecosystem as a whole. And those species are what ecologists term as indicator species. So indicator species have broadly, you know, uh, three sort of meanings, you could say. So they are species or a group of species that reflect the biotic and abiotic state of an environment. They also reveal evidence for or the impacts of environmental changes. And they indicate the diversity of other species or taxa in that entire community. Let's uh, look at each of these definitions. So they are species 
or groups of species that re reflect the biotic or abiotic state of an environment. Now, bi <clears throat> sorry, biotic and abiotic is basically living, okay, like uh, movable and abiotic is non-movable of sorts. So in biotic, if you look, we can uh, speak about frog as an example. Frogs have their skin, which is very sensitive to, uh, you know, all these chemicals and toxins. So uh, them being uh, habitants of uh, aquatic systems, if you have an aquatic system, which is not very, uh, you know, uh, it, it's full of toxins or, you know, it's not very habitable, then there is a chance that you will not find many species of frogs that would be living in that particular region. As well as if you look at corals, so uh, coral bleaching, the concept where uh, the coral polyps give out zooxanthellae because uh, of uh, changing temperature, zooxanthellae produce a certain chemical which the corals can no longer tolerate. It's, it's basically toxic to the coral and hence they expel zooxanthellae because of which corals lose their color, lose their uh, living form. So they are what we call bleached. And uh, this happens due to environmental effects. So in both of these examples, you can see it's because of toxins or it's because of harmful chemicals or bad environment is uh, what is causing this spe these species to not be able to survive in that particular habitat. And hence, you can term these as indicator species of those habitats. So if you don't find a frog somewhere, there's a good chance that that place is not very clean. Or if you find the corals bleached in a particular uh, uh, you know, in a particular uh, water body, that means the water, the temperatures are actually getting high and uh, climate change is actually happening. Global temperatures and ocean sea levels are rising. The next uh, definition says that they reveal evidence for or impacts of environmental changes. For example, water hyacinth could indicate negative water health. Now, water hyacinth is uh, known, its roots, is no, its roots are known to absorb uh, toxins from the water again. So unless introduced, uh, this is not an example for if they are introduced, if they are not, and if they are growing by themselves in a water body, there is a good chance that that water in that particular lake or pond is pretty contaminated. And uh, if water hyacinth is growing, since these guys are also invasive as a species, they are not native to India, they are from Brazil. So uh, the chances are that that water is really contaminated. And again, they act as uh, evidence for environmental change. Now, that being said, some people also introduce water hyacinth in order to clear out toxics, uh, toxins and chemicals into the water, uh, after which they are sort of harvested and then there is uh, life that starts to thrive in there. So these can also act as an indicator species. And finally, they indicate the diversity of other species or taxa or entire communities within an area so an example of it could be like uh, a big mammal, tiger. So how tiger? Because uh, when there is tiger, which is an apex predator, it will keep a check on your uh, on your species, on your um, uh, herbivorous species, because of which there will not be a decline in your uh, plant vegetation and all of the other animals that are dependent on that particular vegetation will sort of be able to, uh, you know, thrive and uh, that being said so tiger interdependence because of which the entire ecosystem is able to survive so in that manner tiger could also act as an indicator species for the diversity uh, to indicate the diversity of other species within the taxa so in this way you have different sorts of species uh, that can act as indicators now, when you talk about indicator species, some of you must have heard of some other, um, you know, terminologies that also come uh, when you talk about these kind of things in ecology, and they can sort of usually be very confusing. So you have indicator species, you have keystone species, you have pioneer species, you have flagship species, you have umbrella species, and you also have priority species. Let's uh, quickly discuss them one by one. So. Indicator species is something that I have already spoken to you about. Keystone species, I will come to that in the next slide. Pioneer species are basically those species that arrive first at any particular region. Okay, uh, for example, lichens itself. Okay, so um, even in the harshest of uh, you know uh, habitats, 
if you uh, maybe turn rocks or if you look around, you will definitely find some sort of species of lichen growing over there. So they are usually the first species that arrive in a particular habitat are called pioneer species. Then you have flagship species. Flagship species are basically those species that are sort of the ambassador species or, you know, a symbol of that habitat. Okay. So uh, these species are sort of important to that habitat and a lot of conservation efforts around that habitat can happen because of these species. Example, tigers in Sundarbans. So they are sort of flagship species over there. Now, flagship species may or may not be indicator species. Okay. There's no... Um, hard and fast rule that comes there. It's not like every uh, flagship species has to be an indicator species, but an indicator species can be a flagship species. Then we have umbrella species. They are species that uh, sort of make, uh, help make conservation decisions around a particular habitat. Okay, uh, so basically if you protect these species, you can also have the other species in that particular habitat protected. So they are sort of uh, interchangeable these terms not completely interchangeable but uh, it sort of encompasses the same ideas that you have ki uh, isse protect karenge to baki sare jo interdependent hai wo sab bhi thode se protect ho jayenge so it's important that the species is taken care of and finally you have priority species priority species is a term that is uh, introduced by wwf that is the uh, world wide fund for nature so priority species is basically a flagship or a keystone species that is representative of a particular region. Example, Great Indian Bustards. So they are representatives of the grassland habitat. So uh, these species can also be reflective of the threats that you can find in that particular region, right? Because uh, studying these species then will help us understand what are the other threats that are faced by that particular habitat. And hence, these species become important to protect. So here, are, these are a few terms that can easily be confused uh, among each other. And uh, so and just trying to clear a few doubts over there. Now, indicator species and keystone species. Like I said, I will come back to keystone species. Keystone species are those that play a very important role in the functioning of the ecosystem. Okay, meaning if you take that particular species out, you can have the entire ecosystem actually collapse. And one very uh, classic example of keystone species is the uh, species that, uh, of wolves that you see in the Yellowstone National Park. Okay, and uh, the, the basic idea of uh, what happened at Yellowstone National Park is that the wolves, they were sort of taken out, not taken out in the sense they were uh, they vanished from the Yellowstone National Park because of which there was no one to keep a check on the, um, the uh, herbivores in that particular region because of which there was uh, very uh, too much of uh, vegetation loss because of which your river started to shrink and because of uh, there was a lot of soil degradation and a lot of things sort of went cascading down. But as soon as the wolves were reintroduced into that particular ecosystem, you could see everything fall back into place. Your birds started to come back. The river started to thrive. The vegetation started to thrive. The herbivores were kept in check. So that is the importance of a keystone species. So can a keystone species be considered as an indicator species? Of course, yes. But do all indicator species uh, classify as keystone species? Well, not really. That is the basic difference between the two of these. So indicator species are usually a very valuable tool to evaluate the conditions of a particular habitat. So their presence or absence can definitely tell you whether this habitat is good or not. Example, we spoke about the water hyacinth. So that can tell you that the water quality is actually bad, bad. Dragonflies can indicate positive water health because when they, they basically dragonflies have their entire life cycle dependent on water, right? From laying eggs to, you know, becoming a fully grown adult, entire lifespan is dependent on water. And if your water health is bad, you will not see dragonflies in that particular region. So if you see dragonflies, they are a very good indication of good water health. And if you don't see them, it means the quality of water is probably bad in that particular area. So indicator species can serve 
to tell you both the negative and the positive impact uh, impacts it's not just uh, you know one side of the story how are bioindicators determined bioindicators are not a sure shot way of determining whether a particular habitat is healthy or not but rather an acceptable measure to make rough estimates based on species that have moderate tolerance so you can't really pick the species that are uh, you know extremely vulnerable to change or are extremely adaptable right because uh, if you pick species that are on either end of the spectrum you will not be able to fully determine the overall so we are trying to get like an average and overall estimation so it's very important to understand that these species can help you estimate what is happening in a particular habitat all right so you can definitely not pick those that are very very sensitive you can definitely not pick those that are completely uh, hardy for that environment so like the statement says rare species with narrow tolerance are often too sensitive to environmental changes so uh, or too uncommon to represent the generic biotic response and those white those which are widespread have too broad a tolerance range and therefore uh, that their population would anyway not get disrupted with any kind of changes so uh, it's it's a difficult measure but it's important to very uh, uh, you know understand the particular habitat nicely and then pick a particular species that can be used as indicators so then who qualify as indicator so who qualify as indicator species uh it's not always just animals even though i have been mostly speaking about animal examples here both plants and animals can qualify as indicator species but it's usually animals are most often used as indicator species and very particular animals invertebrates almost 70% of your indicator species are invertebrates the reason being that they are very less mobile they can't just walk away and change their uh, uh, niches as per you know whatever is the availability there so it's difficult for them to migrate to a healthy environment and hence they can tell you better about how a particular habitat is doing and hence these can be used but again there is no standardized method or standardized list of uh, selecting indicator species so far you might would have understood that indicator species they can differ from region to region right so uh, it can it it really depends upon the micro habitat that is existing in that particular region you don't have a standardized list ki nahi tiger ko hi lena padega in this region ya uh, gib ko hi lena padega ya frog ko hi lena padega it really depends on what kind of habitat you are studying and what is it over there that can be most susceptible to change which helps make an estimate to understand the habitat and this itself cannot be the only thing that uh, can help you study that particular habitat you have to take other measures so let's watch the short video as and to understand better a quick example and a very classic example lichens this woodland is home to a vast array of organisms it's home to birds, insects, and many different plant species. But what we're looking for lives on this tree. This is a lichen. There's 18,000 species of these strange organisms, and they live on rocks, plants, and in the soil all around the world. But what are they, and why are they important? There's something very unusual about these organisms, and it's not just because they look a little strange. So to find out more, we talk to an expert. So a lichen is a symbiotic organism that's composed of the fungus, which makes up the body of the lichen and provides kind of the structure and the environmental control for that organism. And then you have the algae, which is responsible for photosynthesis and provides food for the lichen through that process. And then some lichens also have a third partner, which is a cyanobacteria. 
And that not only provides food through photosynthesis, but also fixes nitrogen in the form of nitrogen gas from the atmosphere into a form that plants and the fungus itself can utilize for growth. Symbiosis is an intimate biological union between two organisms. This is essentially a gradient with mutualisms at one end and parasitisms at the other. And so where do lichens fall? Well, it depends on the lichen. Uh, one of my favorite lichenologists was quoted as saying that lichens are fungi that have discovered agriculture. So some people think that the fungus kind of enslaves the algae and uses it and farms it for food, basically. And that would be more of the view of the parasitism. Whereas uh, there's other examples where it's quite clear that both uh, partners in the relationship are gaining benefit, and that would be more of a mutualism. Now, looking at lichens, you might not think that they're particularly important in the grand scheme of things. Well, it turns out lichens form key roles in ecosystems around the world. First of all, they provide habitat, food and shelter for a whole array of other organisms. This could be a bird using lichen for a nesting material, or even a home for a very small organism, like a tardigrade. Lichens also act as pioneer species. By colonizing bare rock and through the chemical weathering from the acids they produce, they actually break down the rock and form a soil base. And they also play a role in nutrient cycling. The cyanobacteria in the lichens fix nitrogen, essentially taking nitrogen from the atmosphere and making it available for plants. And this is, of course, not forgetting their role in carbon capture. But maybe most interesting of all the roles are as environmental monitors. Different lichens have a different tolerances to air pollution. So some lichens really like nitrogen-rich environments, whereas some lichens are much more sensitive to nutrients in an environment. And so scientists have conducted studies all across the United States. And what they do is they collect data on the number of lichen species and the abundance of lichen species in a given plot. And they know which lichens are indicators of which kind of air quality. And so they can track these plots over large periods of time in large geographical areas and use those lichens as a cheap and effective way to monitor air pollution. So the next time you're walking through your local green space, take a minute to appreciate these fascinating and vital organisms. If you want to... Well, so that is lichens for you. So these Lichens not just serve as pioneer species, like I mentioned earlier in the presentation, but they are also excellent indicators of the environment. And hence, they make one of the classic examples of indicator species because they are very sensitive to whatever the pollute, whatever the uh, you know the situation of that particular habitat is. So, uh, so far, it was always understood that lichens are uh, sensitive to air pollution. So, lichens will not grow in a region where there is pollution. But now studies have also shown that there are certain lichens which grow in these particular regions. So if you go into the depth of this entire thing, you will actually be able to, you know, identify the lichen and study which of these lichens grow in what kind of uh, environment. And you can know the exact kind of uh, uh, thing that is happening in that particular environment, whether it's degraded or whether it's doing great. So that is indicator species. So. Finally, in conclusion, well, indicator species are very specific to an ecosystem, but they serve as an excellent method, as a preliminary or as an additional method to study habitats and to understand ecosystem better. So a lot of ecologists use these within the studies of, uh, you know, the particular habitat that they are doing as an additional, um, as an additional push to whatever is the broader study that is happening. So it's uh, not a very widely, not a very standardized method, but it's a great method because animals and plants, uh, well, you know, they have, they are, they are very particular about how they move around their biological clock. So you will always see that these animals and these plants, they always move in the right and in a certain way, right? And uh, if there is a change that is happening within them, 
definitely can serve as an indicator that something is wrong with the environment or in the habitat that we are living in. And yes, however, these uh, differ from ecosystem to ecosystem and hence can be used as an excellent tool to understand micro habitats as well as nature habitats. So I hope that uh, through this presentation, uh, you can now be more appreciative and be more uh, observant of the different kinds of animals and plants that you see around you and uh, see if you can notice any change and see if that can serve as your indicator species for your areas. Uh, that's it. Thank you so much. And I hope to see you in our next Saturday session.